Good morning, everyone. My name is Judy. I am the Software Development Coordinator at Itasca, and welcome to our webinar today. I am right now, I am going to turn you over to Sean Maxwell, the President of IMAGE, and welcome, everyone. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Judy, for the introduction, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. Um, so the, the topic of the webinar this morning is Microseismic Geomechanics Essentials of Hydraulic Fracturing. And uh, essentially what is going to be about a 30-minute presentation, and uh, it's really meant to be highlights of the 2014 SEG discourse. I think uh, many of you attended that discourse, and you can view this, I guess, as a, a brief refresher. So we thought it was appropriate as the industry starts to uh, recover from the downturn to, uh, we thought it might be helpful to offer this uh, microseismic refresher. So just to begin to uh, explain a, uh, an outline of the presentation, So the, the outline of the presentation, I'm going to start by focusing in on data acquisition, talking about uh, some uh, objectives of recording quality microseismic data. I'll then quickly touch on data processing and particularly focusing on uh, quality control aspects and particularly location uncertainty. Then moving on, I'll talk about interpretation, recognizing data biases in the, uh, the data set, spend a few minutes talking about uh, understanding what microseismic is telling us about the hydraulic fracture, and then finally uh, I'll touch on one application, one kind of case study, talking about operational improvements um, just as, a, as an example. And uh, really the, like the, the discourse, the overall kind of flow of the presentation will be following a, uh, a recommended workflow for a microseismic project and that's shown in the graphic at the bottom of the slide and I think one of the key aspects is to begin by considering the engineering objectives. What are you trying to achieve with the microseismic monitoring? What's the operational impact of the, of the data? What operational question are we trying to address? If we start with that, we can then feed that into a, uh, a survey design and um, look at acquiring the proper microseismic data to address that objectives, and then continuing the cycle, moving through processing, quality control, and ultimately interpretation. And I think a key to this workflow is it needs to be a closed circle, that as we go through the microseismic project, we should start and end with the objectives and uh, interpret the microseismic so that we can make uh, specific re recommendations aligned with that uh, engineering objective. So just to begin with, um, just a very brief slide to introduce microseismic. I, I suspect all you are already familiar with the technology and uh, I'll kick it off by just uh, a quick example of uh, a microseismic image and uh, what you see on the side is a, a map view, different colors or different fracturing stages. And in this particular case you can see towards the, if you can see my cursor here towards the toe of the well, three colors, three fracture stages went into the same place along the well bore. This was due to uh, an issue with the mechanical completion of this well, the sliding sleeves didn't work properly and microseismic was used in this example to understand, diagnose and help correct the problem. So after it's corrected you can see the last three stages were placed in the proper place along the well bore. So uh, a good application of microseismic in this case in real time to help an operational issue but more generally, we can look at uh, different classes, different ways that microseismic can be used to improve hydraulic fracturing. And uh, if you look in the SP literature, for instance, you can see a number of case studies that can be classified in the, the groupings I'll show here. So one common method is to use microseismic to operate, op optimize the stimulation design. 
Um, for instance, maybe optimizing the injection rate. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show an example of, of a case study doing exactly that. You can also use Microseismic to validate your completion design, whether or not the hydraulic fractures are being placed properly along the, the wellbore. And the first case study that I, I quickly showed here was an example of doing that. You can also use Microseismic to help refine the well plan, in particular address questions like uh, the optimal landing point for the wellbore. And I think the direction we're trying to go with the technology ultimately in the industry is to use as a reservoir management tool and look at thing, important topics like uh, well spacing, well placement, and sequencing between, uh, between wells. So before starting a microseismic project, I think it's important to, uh, to interface with the engineers and really understand what, uh, what keeps them up at night, what are their primary concerns, and how can microseismic be used to address those concerns. So which of this kind of laundry list of applications might be particularly relevant for, uh, for a given example. Okay, so with that, with the, the starting point of def defining the objectives, the next step is to, uh, to start to look at acquisition. And uh, um, this is a slide that's really just meant to uh, lay out different acquisition geometry options. And it can be broadly classified as uh, surface or shallow grid, near, shallow well, near, near surface acquisition compared to downhole, uh, this is meant to be a comprehensive slide of all the, uh, the microseismic monitoring options, but the most common are for downhole, for instance, would be a, a wireline deployed observation well, either in a vertical or a horizontal well. So as a starting point, I think it's important to, uh, to consider what the monitoring acquisition options would be. A common one would be, say, surface or downhole. Um, and uh, the next few slides are, are kind of really meant to help uh, maybe give some tips in terms of that decision process. So, of course, regardless of how we acquire microseismic, the monitoring array is going to have a large impact on the results. And regardless of the monitoring geometry, we can expect that geometry to introduce certain biases in the data that's recorded both in terms of the sensitivity as well as the accuracy of the, the microseismic events. So you can think of that as the, uh, the acquisition footprint, if you like. The, the acquisition geometry is always going to have a large control on the final microseismic image. And just as an example of that, this is uh, showing two different monitoring geometries on a, a, a project where the, the downhole monitoring array, a, a vertical array is being shown on the left-hand side, map view and depth section, and uh, in the vertical section of uh, a neighboring horizontal well, a series of geophones were deployed, and you can see the distribution of the microseismic along the wellbore, colors or stages, sizes or magnitudes, and what you can see is for all stages, we're seeing good coverage along the length of the wellbore. The, the fracture length, the distance of the microseismic away from the well is pretty consistent. In cross-sectional view, you can see there's uh, some upward growth, microseismic sitting above the lateral, and they're concentrating at a particular depth. So in this case, uh, a shallow grid was also deployed, and as a test, um, the client here was looking at a comparison between uh, the difference between the shallow grid and the downhole example. Um, so what you can see, this is exactly the same hydraulic fracture image just recorded with a different geometry. You can see the impact of uh, decreased sensitivity. So the shallow grid is simply picking up the, the bigger events. You still get the same sort of, um, with fewer events, the same sort of uh, concept of the, the fracture geometry, the length and the distribution along the wellbore. Um, but also I'd like to point your attention to the depth section from the shallow grid. You can see there's less clustering of the events in the, the shallow region compared to the downhole. So that's associated with increased depth uncertainty from the shallow grid. So this is an example that shows the difference in sensitivity and the accuracy between the, uh, 
these two geometries. In terms of the sensitivity, it, um, I'll just quick reminder that uh, if this had been a full surface array with lines of sensors or patches, for instance, a larger sensor count, we would have been able to stack more and increase the sensitivity to uh, have more consistent uh, sensitivity responses. But this is, uh, if you like, sort of an apples to apples comparison between uh, a downhole image and uh, a shallow grid buried array image. So that's after the fact, but um, I think what's important for microseismic and maybe uh, a tool that we're not using maybe as much as we should is looking at the survey design before we ever uh, go out and collect the data. So in this slide, I'm showing uh, a sequence of, uh, if you like, increasing uh, um, complexity or uh, um, increased uh, more comprehensive uh, survey design tools that uh, they are available. So at the top of the list is using kind of a simple rule of thumb. And unfortunately, I, I think we're still in a position where often simple rules of thumb that are being used to design the microseismic array. What's, what's available, and I think unfortunately what's a little bit underused, is calculating the array performance. So I think all the microseismic vendors have good tools for doing this, predicting the, uh, the minimum magnitude that can be picked up for a given array, looking at sensitivity for that, for say background noise or attenuation. And equally we can look at uh, predicting the location uncertainty to look at how the, uh, the accuracy of the microseismic events would be expected to uh, be defined. So that's a tool that's out there and existing. And uh, another potential tool is to look at trying to compare the, say, two different arrays, say surface and downhole, in terms of the sensitivity and the expected number of events. So if we make some assumption about the frequency magnitude relationship, effectively if we uh, assume a B value, the slope of that uh, relationship, based on two array performances, we could then rank that in terms of relative number of events that would be recorded. And I think this is a particularly important to uh, prior to the project to set the expectations of what we expect to be able to achieve. And then finally, kind of the, I think the most sophisticated level of uh, survey design that could be done is looking at generating synthetic seismograms for a particular example and uh, then using those synthetics, processing them again to look at what the ex expected array performance would be. So <clears throat> just to kind of conclude this slide with some, uh, some uh, tips, I guess, in terms of performing a survey design before the data acquisition. Um, again, I think it's important to start with objectives. So for instance, is a fracture height that's particularly important to be defined? Then look at the logistics, define what the monitoring job tree options would be, compute the sensitivity or estimate the sensitivity and accuracy for the different arrays, and rank them. And then finally, obviously, the, uh, the cost of the, the different uh, scenarios also needs to be considered. All right, so I think following uh, uh, a stepwise approach to survey design like that, we can tie the data acquisition acquisition back to the monitoring objectives, which then, as the data is acquired, leads into the next step of data processing. So I'm not going to go through a lot of details in terms of how we process the microseismic data, particularly for, uh, for locations. What I will say, though, is uh, I'll focus in on uh, quality control aspects of the, uh, the processing. So I think one particular important aspect of the location of the processing and quality control is location uncertainty. The error ellipsoids, or if you like, the error bars associated with the estimated microseismic locations. And what I'm showing here, this it was a, a study done on uh, uh, formation in Canada, the Horn River Basin, and it's kind of a, just meant to be a, a general study. What's What's particularly important here, um, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there's a layered velocity model um, 
consistent with a lot of formations. We have uh, uh, some significant variations in uh, velocities at different depths. And we're looking at comparing, say, two downhole arrays. Um, here, this is a downhole example, but equally it could be applied to surface. Um, so the first um, component of the location uncertainty based on the microseismic signals is how the location is going to change based on uncertainty of the arrival time of the seismic waves at different sensors. And what's shown at the bottom is a Monte Carlo simulation where we've perturbed the arrival times systematically by the order of a few milliseconds consistent with typical time picking accuracy and looking at how the locations are then changing for a spread of uh, different positions. So each one of these clusters in the center is an assumed position. The, uh, this bottom image on the left is showing a shallow array example, and then the same case if we move the geophone slightly deeper, as you can see. So this uh, grouping or cloud of events um, around each assumed position is showing the scatter, or if you like, the statistics of that would be uh, tied into the error ellipsoid that would be um, associated with that event position. Um, comparing these two, you can see the, the deep, in this case, the deeper array as it's sitting across a larger velocity contrast generally does a better job. The errors are, uh, the clusters of events are smaller, meaning the errors are smaller and more consistent across the, the geometry. So this also talks to survey design. This would be the, uh, the preferred uh, depth deployment for these, these sensors. And this, uh, this is a common deliverable in microseismic air ellipsoids, and this is exactly what's being reported, the change in position typically with change in arrival time. There's another important aspect, and that's how the location changes with velocity model. And here again, the, uh, the uh, Monte Carlo is looking at perturbing the velocity model and how the locations are changing. This is obviously an important aspect of the microseismic accuracy, but something that unfortunately is typically not reported, even though we could do uh, sensitivity studies of how the locations change with velocity model. So if we have a good calibrated velocity model, hopefully we're impacting this uh, second source of location uncertainty, but it can be uh, an important element, particularly if it's uh, a poorly uh, calibrated velocity model. So location uncertainties are important, and I'll show an example in a few minutes that uh, demonstrates the, the impact of the location uncertainty on the, the microseismic image. The other important uh, um, quality control aspect from the processing is the signal quality. And all microseismic data is such that uh, for any given project, we'll have a few events that have very high signal to noise, but the majority of the events that we record are going to tend to be more moderate or lower signal to noise ratio, just tied into the, the typical frequency magnitude relationships. And what's being shown here at the, the top is just two signals with different signal to noise ratio. There's two, uh, two ways to kind of quantify the signal to noise ratio or the signal quality. One, of course, would be that signal to noise ratio that I just described. Another one would be, say, a confidence factor where different attributes are added together to rank the, uh, the signal quality. A confidence factor, there's a number of uh, microseismic vendors that are providing the same confidence factor metric for, for the data. And this is another way to, to quantify that signal quality. So the importance of signal quality, it, uh, it should tie into the error ellipsoid in that uh, this more moderate quality signal, for instance, you can see it's more difficult, particularly on the, the bottom sensor here, the lowest sensor, to accurately or confidently identify the arrival time due to the increased noise. But uh, also shown in this display on this um, side here in the blue, these are the, the polarization directions, the P wave. And you can see this low quality event, there's a lot of scatter in the direction of the arrival time just due to the impact of the noise. So <clears throat> um, I'll show an example again of the impact of signal quality or signal to noise ratio on the microseismic image, but it's, it's important, I think, to 
to have an attribute that quantifies that so that you can uh, use the highest quality data in the interpretation. Okay, so moving on now uh, after the processing, the next part I want to talk briefly about uh, interpretation. And I'm going to focus here the interpretation on data biases. Um, and these are data biases that are going to exist in any microseismic uh, data set. So I'll, I'll talk about them individually and then talk about uh, interpretation ways that you can use to, to mitigate these biases. So there's four we'll touch on. The first one is detection bias. And you can see at the end of each one of these lists I've indicated either under or over. Under meaning uh, the bias might mean that we're underestimating the, uh, the fracture geometry. That would be the case for detection bias or potential radiation pattern bias. There's also biases that could overestimate, and that would be due to location uncertainty and signal-to-noise ratio. So I'll talk about these individually and show you examples and give some suggestions of how to treat it. So the detection bias aspect is, is simply the, the sensitivity of the recording. And uh, um, an important QC tool for that is a plot that's commonly done plotting the magnitude of the microseismic events against distance. This is, uh, I'll focus here just on downhole examples, but uh, all these biases are equally important for surface or buried grid monitoring. And the detection bias for downhole is readily uh, apparent if you look at these magnitudes with distance. And what it's related to is the increase of the magnitude, the smallest magnitude that's being picked up, obviously gets larger and larger as we get further and further from the, the monitoring array. So an example shown at the bottom, this is a, a three-well frac. There's a, a, a vertical monitoring well in the center flagged by the, the arrow. And the, uh, the two uh, images on the right and left side, the same results. Only difference is on this side, we're showing all the events. On the right-hand side, we've just shown the events above some magnitude level. And it's, uh, in this case, a magnitude uh, minus 2.2. Above that level, we, uh, over a certain distance, we're removing that uh, sensitivity bias of recording the smaller events closer to the geophones. So <clears throat> another way to look at this would be to draw a circle of radius equivalent to where that, uh, that magnitude threshold crosses the magnitude distance curve. And what it means is everywhere within that circle, we'll be able to record events of this magnitude. Why it's important is uh, if you look at this particular microseismic image, for instance, you can see a lack of microseismic um, northeast of these wellbores. And so that, a good question to ask before interpreting, is that just a sensitivity bias? Is it simply too far away from the geophones to be detected? And by looking at this, it falls within our detection range. And this particular image would be uh, um, what we'd expect to record if the monitoring well was anywhere within that circle, these events would be expected to be recorded. So I think this, this bias is particularly uh, often well known and treated in most interpretations. The next ones are maybe, uh, maybe not so well treated. Um, the next one I want to touch on is radiation pattern bias. And I'll start with the, uh, the example on the right hand side. At the top, this is a, a, multi, a map view of a multi-stage horizontal well. This is uh, some work that uh, was done, published by Jim Rutledge. And what's being plotted here, the events are color-coded based on the amplitude ratio between the P wave and the shear wave. You can see there's a systematic trend in the data, and uh, we can fit that trend if we look at plotting the amplitude ratio with angle of the events back to the monitoring well in the second in the center, rather, we can map this as uh, uh, a unique radiation pattern. And there's a lot of discussion with examples like this indicating that bedding plane slip is an important mechanism for the microseismic. What I want to draw your attention to, though, is in directions where we go through a nodal plane, where one of the, either the P wave or the shear wave amplitude is disappearing, what you can see is there's a lack of microseismic events in those areas. 
And in the map view, you can see the, the fracture geometry or the extents is reduced, particularly in the center of this kind of red area where we're having uh, low PDAS amplitude ratios. So our reason for that is the, uh, the P wave is disappearing in that direction. And during the processing, when we identify events based on both the P and an S arrival, we, uh, we might miss events and that might restrict the geometry that's being um, uh, interpreted. This is just another example on the left-hand side, the same thing, a map view, observation well, treatment well, single stage frac, and uh, here the event's size is scaled by the PS amplitude ratio. Also, you can see it goes through uh, a nodal plane, the event symbols get smaller as the amplitude ratio comes down. You can see fewer events on that side. In this case, it has an impact at the geometry because the fracture grows out the other side and we're able to pick up its entire geometry. So a simple kind of tip to, uh, to account for this in an interpretation is just either color code or size of symbols based on the PDAS amplitude ratio. Look for systematic trends and make sure it's not impacting the, uh, the geometry making sure the geometry is not stopping in extreme, um, extreme amplitude ratios. Okay, the next one is looking at uh, an example of uncertainty bias. And um, uh, this is the impact of those uh, error ellipsoids on the, the microseismic image. So a map view, observation well, treatment well, a single stage frac again. Um, here the, the symbols are colored by time and sized by, by magnitude. And if you just look at the distribution of the microseismic events close to the observation well, you can see the microseismic kind of clusters into a, a narrow kind of planar type pattern. Closer to the treatment well, things are more diffuse, more spread out. It's a wider zone. There's also fewer events, um, and that's related to the, the sensitivity bias we haven't uh, we don't have a magnitude cutoff here, um, but uh, I wanted to focus on the spread of event locations. So you could potentially interpret that, that maybe there's more fracture complexity, more natural fracture activation close to the treatment well. But if you simply look at the same thing and turn on the air ellipsoids, what you can see is the air ellipsoids are much bigger in that region as we get further from the monitoring well, the, the air ellipsoids spread out. And that increase in location uncertainty is causing the spread in locations that we, uh, we saw in the image. So a simple tip here is when, when you're inferring a fracture dimension, whether it's height, length, or width, it's important to visualize the air ellipsoids and particularly the direction of maximum uncertainty to uh, understand how that would impact the, uh, the geometry that's being measured. Then the final example is just looking at the impact of signal-to-noise ratio. And what's being shown here is one, um, one image. It's, it's actually the same as the amplitude ratio we saw a few moments ago. And it's being plotted here using different signal-to-noise ratio cutoffs. On the left-hand side, quite a low cutoff, a factor of 2.5. And then increasing that up to 5 on the right-hand side. And what you can see is... Uh, the microseismic zone is becoming more compressed. And the reason for that is we're pulling out just the higher quality data. We have more confidence in the microseismic location shown here compared to here. So the lack of signal confidence here is causing increased location uncertainty, a spread in the locations, and it's making the, the hydraulic fracture look bigger because of that microseismic uncertainty. So at the bottom here, this is looking at systematically how the number of events are changing as we change the signal-to-noise ratio cutoff. Um, and uh, what it points out is obviously we're looking at fewer and fewer events as we look at uh, higher and higher signal-to-noise ratios. In the middle, I've, we've estimated the, uh, the microseismic volume, if you like, the stimulated reservoir volume proxy. And what it shows is low signal-to-noise ratio. It looks like a, a big SRV because things are quite spread out. More realistically, though, this is more typical of what we'd expect at uh, higher signal-to-noise ratio. So this is a common attribute that should be reported in the microseismic data. And uh, a good way to treat this is to uh, try to set the signal-to-noise ratio 
relatively high. I, I personally, I like to use a value around five as kind of a cutoff, and then uh, provided you have enough microseismic image, microseismic events, then to image the fracture, that would be a, a preferred data set to uh, focus the interpretation on. If you like cherry picking the, the best quality data. All right, <clears throat> so the, that leads us through the acquisition processing and interpretation. I also wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about understanding what the microseismic is telling us about the hydraulic fracture. And uh, um, to start with, um, I'd like to share a slide. And when I was doing the discourse, I'd often describe that this was probably the uh, I think the single most important slide that I showed during the day-long course, so obviously I thought it was important to include it in this brief refresher highlight uh, presentation. So what we're looking at here is uh, um, we're going to look at an example. It's a Barnett shale. It's just an arbitrary example of a four-stage frac. And uh, what we've done here is we've taken all the microseismic events. For each one, we have a seismic moment, and that's used for the moment magnitude. And we've added all that seismic moment up together, divided by the shear modulus. And the reason for doing that, once we add that together and normalize by the, the shear modulus, based on the definition of seismic moment, this will give us the total area times displacement of the, the rock movement causing all the microseismic sources. So we can add that together and look at a, a total volume associated with all those microseismic data combined together. And then we can compare that volume with how much the volume of fluid that we're injecting um, into the formation. So in the table at the bottom, you can see the, the microseismic volumes that we're estimating for the four stages are less than a barrel in oil field units. Even though we've injected over 25,000 barrels of fluid into the formation. So we can look at the ratios of those in you can do the same thing for energy, for instance, but I think maybe the volume is more uh, intuitive. What this is indicating is the, the microseismic activity, the snaps and the cracks that we hear as we hydraulic fracture, are one part of the deformation. But there's a lot of deformation that's taking place aseismically. So what I think is particularly important is slow opening of the tensile fracture. That's going to be an aseismic process. And Based on these ratios, on the, both the volume and the energetic considerations, that aseismic deformation is, is larger than the microseismic deformation. So the point of this is microseismic is an excellent way to, con to understand the fracture geometry, but as we try to get more information and uh, look at more quantitative interpretations of the microseismic, we have to recognize the fact that it's not all the deformation taking place in the reservoir. And the next few slides will kind of build on that as well. So <clears throat> looking at uh, interpretation of hydraulic fractures, often uh, most of the interpretation, the so-called dots in the box type interpretation, is really qualitative looking at geometric effects. And this is just an example, a map view of a multi-well pad from the Marcellus, and you can see interpretation of the microseismic geometry from that. There's a lot of interest these days with uh, trying to collect source mechanisms, so-called moment tensor inversion, so we can understand how the rock breaks, shear opening, and more importantly, use that information to define the fracture planes associated with individual microseismic events if you like, working towards defining more of a, a microseismic fracture image instead of a, a single location. And this is just an example from uh, uh, Western Canada of doing that. The, instead of dots, the events are shown as a series of uh, disks, so you can get a, a sense of a, a microseismic fracture image from this. What's important, and Kind of an analogy I like to use that's kind of convenient based on the color of the microseismic uh, disks in this particular example with everything colored green. I think the way to view this is very much like looking at a, a tree. And what we're seeing is the leaves on the tree. What we're not seeing is the trunk or the branches holding it up. The analogy for the hydraulic fracture is what we're not seeing on this is a plumbing system, the flow causing the microseismic movements. 
and again, that uh, that plumbing system would be a seismic deformation deformation that we're not picking up. So that leads into a concept of uh, um, the components of a hydraulic fracture or anatomy of a hydraulic fracture, and this is just uh, um, from a leading edge paper that uh, that we worked on after the discourse. So I thought it was useful to include this just to. Uh, set the context of what microseismic is showing us and relate the plumbing system to the microseismic activity. So <clears throat> in this plot map view, we've got uh, our well bore and we've got pre some pre-existing fractures in the, uh, the formation. It's variable with formation and uh, not only vertical fractures, but bedding planes I think are also important in terms of understanding the microseismic response. As we pump our hydraulic fractures, we're going to create mode one tensile fractures, if you like, the plumbing system, so-called primary hydraulic fractures, moving out from the stages of the perforation clusters of the, of the well. That uh, pressurized opening dilating uh, uh, primary fracture will then activate the pre-existing fractures, cause them to move, and those movements are what we pick up from the microseismic. So in this example, we've tried to differentiate between pressure activated and stress activated at the top and the bottom. But, but really what the microseismic, regardless of the mechanism, is showing us is the activation of the DFN. And really that's the, uh, the leaves on the tree in the microseismic fracture network image that I showed previously. And uh, keep in mind there's, again, a plumbing system that's aseismic, not generating seismic activity, driving that. Also keep in mind the propent that we pump, which is going to be the effective part of the hydraulic fracture, is going to be confined to the primary fractures. These, uh, these movements in the discrete fracture network, in many cases, aren't significant enough to take propent. There might be a self-propping mechanism, but most of the propent is going to sit in the primary fractures. And one thing we don't see from the microseismic is that propent distribution, even though it's very important in terms of the, uh, the effectiveness of the fracture. And I think what we're starting to see is coupled models, hydraulic fracture geomechanical models to link everything together and uh, use that as a tool to predict where is the propent within the microseismic cloud. All right, so moving towards the end now, um, just to kind of wrap up, I, I now want to just quickly talk about a case study, and it's really tied into this uh, this workflow of uh, an example of defining engineering objectives up front, doing a test, and then using the microseismic and going through the steps of this workflow, feeding back to the uh, the original objectives. And uh, the example I'd like to show is, um, I think this is a particularly nice one, <clears throat> where the engineering objective was to try to look at optimizing the fracture injection rate to optimize the fracture height. And uh, before collecting the microseismic, um, in this particular example, you could kind of sketch out what you would expect to see as, uh, um, as rates change during a, a completion test. So just kind of a cartoon, a cross-sectional view, and what simply what this is showing in the middle is kind of the reservoir target. And if we might expect if we pump at low rate, we might keep our fractures contained to that reservoir target. If we pump at too high of a rate, force the fluid in too quickly, we could see some height growth, some um, fracture growth, and hence microseismic out of zone. So this is an example of doing it exactly that. This is from the Eagleford Shale. And what we're looking at here is a cross-sectional view. Um, blue is a lateral well. It's drilled in the, the lower Eagleford. And uh, the lower upper Eagleford package is really the, the target here. Um, in this particular case, stage by stage, the different colors are different fracture stages. And the injection rate has been changed for each stage. And the microseismic has been used as a diagnostic then to see how the fracture geometry is changing. So the first two stages were pumped at a uh, high rate, and you can see there's a lot of height growth. The microseismic's broken above the top of the Eagleford into the Austin shock, providing undesired um, height growth. So the, 
the fracture cost, the paying for the horsepower of the hydraulic fracture has been partially wasted here, putting the horsepower to break non-targeted uh, reservoir. So stage three, the rate was decreased down to 80 barrels per minute. And then stage by stage was increased up to about 110 barrels by uh, stage eight shown in red. And you can see those more moderate injection rates, the microseismic showing the fractures contained to the reservoir. In the final stage here, the, the rate was returned to 120 barrels per minute as a test. Again, it broke out of zone. So in this particular case, it looks like there's a threshold on the, on the injection rate below about 110 barrels and below we get, uh, we're seeing fracture containment, but if we go too high, we break out of zone. So I think a particularly nice example to demonstrate that, uh, that kind of workflow and here, this is an example where you could do the microseismic and then make a specific recommendation to the operation of how to improve. And uh, one of the motivations for this, I guess, uh, using this as a case study is I often hear from clients that uh, the microseismic has been uh, collected and acquired, but no changes in the completion were made. So what's the value? So I think this is a, a nice case where the, the value can be demonstrated. And then to build on that, uh, just getting into the last few summary slides here, um, I think an important topic as we, as the industry recovers and we get, uh, we start to see an uptake in operations again, is to consider the value proposition, not just of microseismic, but all the technologies we're applying. But I think there's a lot of interest in understanding the, the, the value proposition of microseismic in particular. Um, so I've tried to kind of encapsulate this on, on that slide and try to uh, relatively rank the value proposition for different applications of microseismic. So at the top of the list is uh, operational issues. And quite often with, while collecting microseismic, an operational issue might come up on the wellbore, in which case by serendipity the microseismic might show value in terms of helping that operational issue. Um, but also we can look at it um, as the case of the Eagle Fruit example I just showed to help with stage optimization. Um, there's different ways to do that. I showed a rate example, but there's other parameters that microseismic could be used to really try to optimize that, uh, that stage performance, minimize operational costs, by, and maximize uh, obviously production. This question around a lot of interest around refracturing as a technology with the infrastructure in place. And uh, I think that's another application where microseismic uh, can provide value, even though I think as an industry we're really struggling to uh, really get uh, effective refracturing operations. But moving on, we can also look at optimizing the well, looking at the completion, things like landing point, stage spacing. And as we move from optimizing a stage to the well, I think the value proposition simply increases, and even more so if we extend that to a pad and start to look at important questions like well spacing and sequencing, parent-child relationships. This, these are uh, very important decisions that have to be made in, the, in various field developments, and I think what we're seeing, particularly as we get into stack plays, is quite complicated responses. I don't think microseismic is the only answer, I think tied into tracer, pressure hits, and geomechanical understanding of the, uh, the, uh, the stack sequences. Using the microseismic to calibrate the geomechanics, I think we can make impacts and better decisions on the uh, optimizing the pads. And then the other aspect that's becoming increasingly important is the question of induced seismicity, hydroc particularly hydraulic fracture induced seismicity which unfortunately is a problem that we're facing in Western Canada, for instance. We're seeing mandatory monitoring and regulatory compliance using uh, seismic monitoring, and really um, that's uh, another important uh, value proposition to microseismic. So just to conclude here, I just wanted to kind of wrap up with uh, some final tips on, uh, on uh, how to uh, how to maybe run a, an effective or efficient microseismic project. So up front, when you're considering whether or not to run microseismic, uh, I think an important question to ask is, are you going to be able to optimize things if you don't know where the fracks are going? 
And if you need to know the fracture geometry away from the wellbore, I think microseismic is still the uh, the uh, the best tool we have out there to uh, to monitor that. Um, <clears throat> before collecting the microseismic, though, I think it's important to define the engineering objectives, the problems we're trying to address, then assess all the acquisition options instead of just running either just surface or just downhole as kind of preferred monitoring geometries, look at the options and rank them and pick the one that's best suited to the engineering objectives. Then uh, my, my suggestion would be spend a lot of effort on quality control, bird dogging the microseismic, it's processing, particularly things like the velocity model. When you get to the interpretation, assess your monitoring biases. I'd suggest integrate the data as much as you can with supplementary data to, to extend the understanding of what's happening. Um, I think we're seeing increased recognition of the importance of geomechanics and understanding geomechanics. So integrating the microseismic with geomechanics, I think, is uh, an important direction the industry is starting to go. At the end of the day, the microseismic response is simply the geomechanical response of the reservoir to hydraulic fracturing. So incorporating geomechanics is, I think, very important. Then the final uh, suggestion, I guess, is act on results. We're not going to realize the value from microseismic events if we just look at the images. We have to uh, make informed decisions based on the microseismic data. Um, so that's kind of the end of the technical presentation, and before I open it up to questions here, I just want to, uh, to point out that uh, this is really the first of a series of webinars we're going to be running. The next one is June 22nd, and uh, my colleague, uh, Jun Wai Hong, is going to talk about survey design, and uh, he'll be offering a webinar that'll be uh, a repeat of a keynote address he's going to give at the SEG workshop in China next week. So if you're not traveling to China and attending that workshop, if you want to uh, catch that, that webinar, um, you'd be very welcome, and uh, We'll, we'll send out some information of that, uh, that upcoming webinar. Um, and then we have a series of webinars following that, looking at various aspects that I've introduced uh, this morning. So <clears throat> thank you very much for, for your attention and spending time listening to this. And uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer questions. Um, as Judy indicated to start with, we'd like to uh, if you have any questions, if you could enter it by the, the chat uh, box and uh, we can respond to it. Otherwise, if uh, uh, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to uh, answer any questions offline by, by uh, email if, if you'd like to uh, go that route. Hi, this is Judy. Um, okay, we do have a few questions coming up, and they are, um, what I want to do is unmute William Harbart and give him a chance to ask his questions, if that's all right with you, Sean. It's kind Perfect. of a lengthy question, so. Sure. William, I'm going to be unmuting you. As soon as I... Okay, if you unmute yourself now. All right, um, William. Oh, I'm I just going to... Hi, are you here, William? Okay, I'm going to read the question, Sean, just to make it flow more smoothly. Um, first of all, he has the comment of a fantastic presentation. And it says, what about the indications of LPLD events associated with simulation? Stimulation. Do you think these are real? Yeah, it's a very good question. And uh, thanks for the question, Bill. Um, long period, long duration events, um, I think, goes back to uh, some observations from uh, Mark Sobach's group and uh, kind of an interesting concept. Um, on a number of projects, not only for hydraulic fracturing, but uh, other applications like uh, injection, carbon CO2 injection, for instance, 
Um, I've gone looking for LPLD events, and I haven't had much luck. Um, the uh, so maybe it's not something that's seen on every project, but uh, in projects where we we do see it, and uh, I think it was a Barnett example that uh, that Mark highlighted initially. Um, maybe in certain areas it, it happens, but I also know there is some research done at University of Calgary, Dave Eaton's group. They had a, a few data sets and they looked for similar events and initially they thought they had found some of these long long period, long duration uh, events, so kind of a, a long harmonic signal. But then uh, checking the, the regional earthquake database, they realized that what they were picking up was regional earthquakes. And uh, what was interesting, the, the signal characteristics of those regional earthquakes on the microseismic array looked almost identical in character to the original LPLD events that were, were flagged. So I think it's a good, uh, a good topic and a good topic for continued research. So uh, um, I'd encourage everyone to keep looking because I think there's a lot of, a lot of interest but, uh, in, the, in the observation, but also uh, maybe, maybe everybody's starting to scratch their heads of uh, are they there or not. So th thank you very much for the question, Bill. Okay, and there's a second part to this. Is emission mapping of such events a potential goal for additional monitoring? Also, what about those penguins? Yeah, go penguins. I'm a, a little bit disappointed that all the Canadian NHL teams got uh, knocked out, but, uh, but whenever the Canadian teams are gone from the hockey playoffs, I, I always revert to cheering for the, the Penguins myself, so I was, I was happy to see they they won their second game. Um, and Bill, positioned in at the uh, University of Pittsburgh, I hope you're getting a chance to see some of the hockey games yourself. Um, in terms of being able to uh, image the LPLD events, I think that's more of a challenge. I think uh, by the nature of the events, it's not a a simple transient impulsive signal that we can locate by conventional means. So um, beyond just detecting them, I think imaging those those sources is a challenge. But potentially that could lead into some of this aseismic deformation that we're not seeing from conventional microseismic. So I, I, I guess I, uh, I will point out that I think this could be a uh, potentially important aspect of the, the complete fractured network system. Okay, I have another question here for you, Sean. Um, Hamali says, I didn't see any surface microseismic. Any particular comments on that? Yeah, so surface microseismic, I think, uh, and I didn't include uh, examples here simply for the, for the, uh, the time limit. Um, so I think there's a, a number of formations where I've seen some really nice surface microseismic results. Um, unfortunately, I think there's also some formations where um, surface microseismic has been run in either questionable results or, in some cases, no results. Um, so that kind of leads into the the uh, the survey design aspect. Um, you know, I think we should be able to, and I think we can model this. Uh, this effect, and uh, um, particularly if we have experience in an area, if we understand what the magnitude range of the microseismic events are, if we know the depth and something about the velocity model and the attenuation structure, we can simply model what's the sensitivity both for visible events and then after stacking. And uh, um, we've been involved in a, a couple of international projects where initially surface monitoring had been run and uh, by spending more more time and more effort in the survey design I think we were able to better tune the number of uh, stations that would be required for instance to get a, 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 a get the microseismic uh, image with sufficient events to, to image the process. I think I have a comment to what you're just saying, and it says it has worked great for me in Eagle Ford and Woodford Shale, especially using Fraxstar. Yeah, and uh, I'd agree. 
as well as I think Marcellus is another area where it tends to work well. The Duvernay and the Montney Shale in Western Canada or other formations where, where it's worked. I think maybe the Bakken it's a bit of a, a challenge with surface in my experience. But uh, yeah, there's certain, and a lot of activity these days in the Permian, obviously, and uh, some recent conferences, there's been uh, some good examples of uh, surface monitoring in the, the Permian, so it's starting to work there as well. Okay, now you are getting more love for the penguins, just so you know, and a lot of thank yous and compliments on the presentation. Um, but a few more questions, and one is, to see the fracture direction, I have to consider DE, today, geomechanics. I'm not um, sure if that's a misspelling, and it's not letting me copy you on the email okay. chat. Well, I can uh, I can maybe build on the question, and I don't know if I'll answer the question that was asked. I'll, I'll maybe answer the question I want them to ask. Okay. <laughs> um, so as I said, I think the the micro seismic is really the geomechanical response of the reservoir, and and using a geomechanical model to understand the microseismic events, I think, is uh, is very important. And it's a way to reconcile the uh, what I described as a plumbing system with the, the leaves on the tree, for instance, to go back to the analogy I mentioned. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, an important direction. I think we're just getting started down that direction for hydraulic fracturing. Um, but we know there's going to be different mechanisms causing microseismic events. So the concept of wet and dry microseismic events that I kind of briefly touched on, wet being pressure activated where the fracture network is. But as we change the stress field, we can remotely generate dry microseismic events. I think there's ways to differentiate those two types of events, but uh, also they speak to understanding the, uh, the geomechanical response better. And one of the uh, the upcoming webinars we have uh, is actually uh, focused on uh, on geomechanics. Uh, it'll be uh, uh, the second last one later in October. So I'll maybe defer the true answer to uh, <laughs> to that webinar. And, okay. Uh, um, you've got, you've got about three more questions here, Sean, unless some more pop up. So okay. next is, do you see any new acquisition technologies on the horizon that would make a step change to the sensitivity and accuracy of imaging microseismicity? Yeah, very good question. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's a step change, but I think we've certainly seen an increase in the number of uh, multiple downhole arrays simultaneously to monitor microseismic. And there's no doubt by going past one monitoring well to multiple wells, we can improve the accuracy. Um, unfortunately, related to that, the, the acquisition cost goes up significantly. So I, again, I think there's a trade-off between benefit and cost. Um, I think the big change we see on the horizon is uh, the potential from uh, distributed acoustics using fiber to detect microseismic. Um, I think currently the state of the knowledge, from what I've seen, there's a bit of a challenge in terms of uh, sensitivity that uh, you can record larger magnitude microseismic events, but not, the, not to the same sensitivity level as, say, a geophone array. Hopefully that's just an engineering aspect, and uh, there's a lot of attention, I know, from the fiber optic companies at this application. So hopefully that's something that can be improved upon. Um, I think we also have processing challenges with that geometry in that it's uniaxial along the direction of the fiber for uh, a DAS type configuration. But uh, I think we're continuing to see companies experiment and try to improve. And uh, at the up upcoming ERTEC meeting uh, in San Antonio mid-July, I know there's a number of talks on, uh, on fiber-based microseismic. And uh, so it's... Uh, I think an area to watch. So good question. Thank you for that. Okay, next I have a two-part question. Uh, would you recommend a dual monitor vertical and horizontal system, and what if they don't match each other? 
So I think a very good question, and uh, just comparing just a vertical downhole array with a horizontal array, the horizontal array, again, is going to have a, a different acquisition footprint, and typically the, the depth of the microseismic events won't be as well resolved as the vertical array. Um, so in situations where you can run both, you certainly get the best of both worlds. You get the, the additional coverage of a horizontal array, and provided the events are large enough to be detected on the vertical array as well, you can use it to uh, improve the depth estimate. Um, the, uh, I think the industry has come a long way in terms of uh, acquire, acquiring multi-wall data. So early days, several years ago, there was challenges with timestamps between the different acquisition systems. But uh, I think that's largely been resolved by the acquisition companies. So over the last couple of years, I think we've seen a lot of good examples of, of doing that. And provided you have a timestamp, um, you can then fully integrate the, uh, the two arrays and come up with uh, a combined solution from the, the individual arrays. Thank you. Okay, and the last one I have. Um, what is your response on how laboratory type of testing has helped us to understand the field issues better? Any directions you have or suggestions for the lab approaches? Okay, good question. So I think there's two aspects to the, the sort of concept of a laboratory. Um, for a long time, we've seen uh, taking rock samples into the lab, whether it's a small core sample or some experiments on a, a relatively large block sample, and uh, recording the passive seismic associated with the, uh, the fracturing process. And uh, uh, in the pa sometimes it's called laboratory microseismic. I personally, I don't think it's the best name for it because the uh, the signals, the sources we're picking up are much smaller than conventional microseismic. It's probably more associated with uh, maybe uh, nanoseismic or picoseismic. Um, but recently we've seen uh, some of the research labs start to calibrate the sensors so we can get a moment magnitude estimate. And uh, so one example that uh, colleague of mine was involved in, we uh, were able to get down to magnitude minus six in the lab, and the scaling relationships were the same as field microseismic and induced seismicity telling us the, the source physics is, is the same. So I think that's a growing field, and I think it's a great way to understand what's happening. Um, you know, we can't control the reservoirs, but we can control laboratory experiments. But the other interesting thing I, I just want to quickly point out, and I should point out, by the way, the uh, as a plug for one of my colleagues is going to give the final presentation on exactly that topic, looking at laboratory acoustic emission monitoring. Um, so that's a growing uh, growing field. There's a lot of interest from academics of doing that. But I, I think the type of laboratory experiment I, I would really like to see is an in situ laboratory. Um, maybe hydraulic fracturing and then either coring through. There's been limited uh, cases of doing that. But uh, um, I think mine by experiments, uh, although you need a, a specific location to do this, if you could create a hydraulic fracture and actually put a mining tunnel through it, then you can have good access to the fracture network and come up with a better understanding of the uh, the total system and how it relates to the seismic observations. And we're seeing an increased use of hydraulic fracture fracturing in underground mines, for instance, for various reasons. And uh, um, if we can find an underground mine that's uh, maybe targeting the Eagleford Shale or the uh, the Bakken or the Marcellus, those would be, I think, uh, fantastic fundamental experiments of in situ laboratories really to understand what's happening. So thank you for the question. I hope that uh, at least partially answers it. And that and, answers the questions that we have here, Sean. Fantastic. Well, thank you uh, again, everyone, for your attention and taking the time to uh, to attend. and. Uh, We'll be sending out some information, but uh, um, if you're interested in the survey design aspect, again, I'd encourage you to uh, to get a, 
um, an opportunity to uh, hear Jinwei's keynote address from the SUG workshop on survey design. Thank you, and everybody have a good day. And go Peng, Penguins. Uh, one more question. Um, will this presentation be made available for download? Uh, yes, we've recorded this, and we're going to put it on the image website. Um, but uh, I'd be happy to share slides. So uh, if, if you're interested in the copy of the slides, if you shoot us a note, we can, uh, we can send that to you. We'll probably not put that on the website and make it generally available. But for people that called in, I'd be happy to share it with them. Thank you. All right. Have a good day, everyone.